Welcome back to Questing Beast. I am Ben. Today we're taking a look at the Yellow Book of Breckewold by Matt Strom. Um, I've been following the development of this for some time. I saw that Matt Strom was working on it on his blog, Ice and Ruin, some years ago, but then it went quiet for a long time, and I was very surprised to see it emerge fully formed at uh, Gen Con at the Lamentations booth, where it's been published. This is a bit of an unusual book as far as Lamentations goes. It does not take place in the uh, late medieval period or early modern period as most of their stuff does. And it doesn't have a lot of the you know, hyper gross, ultra gory uh, material that Lamentations is kind of famous for. It's much more traditional in the sense that it could fit really well into any kind of BX campaign. And I think it would go especially well with something like Dolmenwood. Here's the back of the book here, and I love this blurb down here at the bottom. Uh, it answers the question, what if Jack Vance wrote Harry Potter as a sequel to T.H. White's Once and Future King? The general gist of the book is that you are at Breckewold, which is a school for magic, a little bit like Harry Potter, could be a bit like Hogwarts. Um, but most of the adventures not play, take place inside the castle doing lessons and things like that. Rather, you are exploring the mega dungeon that is underneath the castle. Well, maybe it's more like a kilo dungeon. It's a pretty big dungeon. There's a bunch of levels in there. Um, and you're also exploring the hex crawl and the wilderness surrounding the castle. And all of these different areas, the teachers that you're doing school with, you know, it's a little bit abstracted, the dungeon itself and the hex crawl are all linked together with lots of things that cause you to go from one to the other. There's a lot of adventure hooks. There's a lot of things to collect. And it's one little coherent uh, setting almost that you could play in for quite some time. Here's an initial map early on where you have Breckewold Castle right there in the middle, along with a number of locations. We'll see the hex map as we go a bit further into the book, but there's quite a few places to explore. We have a general overview on how to use this campaign and how to fit it into other Lamentations campaigns. It does not take place in the late modern or the early modern period, as I mentioned. It's more in the 900 to 1400 period. So if you wanted to set this in a traditional Lamentations campaign, you could either do time travel, perhaps where they travel to the past, or you could investigate the castle as is, but simply have all of the NPCs in the castle be ghosts. We have a section on conflicts here. These are conflicts between different NPCs, either in the past or the present. These are some of the main plot threads, I suppose, that will get developed over time as you explore more deeply. These will kind of rise to the surface as you get to know the NPCs and figure out what they really want. So Merlin is in the castle, but though he is entombed in a crystal um, by the fairy who seduced him, like in the traditional stories, and you can try and find his tomb. But there's a lot of other people, some of the other witches from the Arthurian legends, like uh, Nimue, if I'm saying that correctly, and Morgaz. And these other witches are all very interested in Merlin and perhaps bringing him back to life. Arthur is also dead because it's after the Arthurian period, but he could be raised from the dead and that could have serious implications for the politics of the region. There is a French spy at Breckewold, sort of an exchange teacher who's teaching there, who thinks that Merlin might be there and wants to take him back to his school in France as a kind of prize. There's the ne Necronomicon. So there's a teacher here who really wants to find the Necronomicon. And of course, it is in the dungeon somewhere. There's some giants that are have their own agendas that are out in the hex crawl. There's a merry band of merry outlaws out in the forest, a little bit like Robin Hood. And there's just a number of other ones as well. So the general structure of the campaign here is that uh, you introduce to the school and you have to pick which teachers and which classes you're going to take during each semester. During each of these semesters or terms, there's an autumn term and a spring term, you get to choose two different classes or tutorials that you're going to take from the different teachers. And by uh, taking these different classes, you're going to maybe learn a little bit more about that type of magic, but really you're going to learn more about that NPC and what they want. And you can start getting adventure hooks from them as they get to know you better. The more classes you take from a particular uh, teacher, the more adventure hooks and more detail you're going to get about things to explore in the dungeon or things to explore in the hex crawl. I should point out that all of the art in the book is all done by the author, Matt Strom. And it's not exactly world-class art, it's kind of amateurish, but I do find it very charming. And I do love it when an author also illustrates their own stuff because you get to see how they envisioned the characters and the events there. So here's the list of all the different teachers right here, along with the different rumors or adventure hooks that they could give you. So for example, this guy, uh, the conjurer, as you take more classes from him, he might uh, learn things from him like, uh, it appears that some horror has climbed up from the bowels of the earth and made its home in the school's cistern and menaces the flooded regions of the dungeon's third level. All the way up to, he possesses the brainstone of a lord of hell. Possession of the stone forces summon demons to resentfully obey commands. So I assume you're gonna unlock better and better stuff as you take more classes with them. 
There is Death Comes Back, who is a necromancer who previously tried to take over the school, but since becoming a lich has now uh, more important things to worry about than simply running a school. There is a uh, half troll smith, there is an alchemist, there's an astronomer, and a lot of these have layers or sections of the dungeon that are kind of themed around them. Uh, there is a lot of weirdness in here. Like I said, this is, like the back of the book said, this is influenced by people like Jack Bantz, as well as T.H. White's ones in Future King. So there's a lot of cosmic strangeness. And it is a dungeon underneath a wizard school. So the explanation, a wizard did it, is going to work really well in most of the cases here. Here's a nice picture of the castle itself. Although your adventuring is really not going to take place here, the whole process of going to class is very abstracted. It's really focused on the dungeoneering and the exploring portions. There's basically seven levels to this dungeon, although there's lots of different links and different ways that you can get around it. There are some sub levels and there's ways you can get out back to the castle and to the hex crawl um, so that you can find, you know, alternate exits. You don't always have to go all the way back down again. Each of the dungeon maps is drawn out like this. It's all hand done. I think it looks pretty nice. I like how each of the rooms has its name uh, written directly on it. So it's not just a number that gives you more information. So you can uh, quickly figure out the, generally what the place is that you're going to. I feel like there could be a little bit more information put on here though. For example, the actual scale of the rooms and how far it is to get from one to the other is not drawn on the map. There's no squares. So if you do a more procedural game where you need to know exactly how far they've gone, or you're like having more tactical combat, you're gonna to have to fill that information in yourself. One thing that confused me for quite a while while I was reading this book is this is the first level of the dungeon. Where is the entrance? Because it's never really spelled out. Eventually, I think I figured out that each of these places, like it says to the library, to the stables, to the muse, these are all different parts of the castle above. So I guess you could start at any of these places that link to part of the actual castle. If it says to like to Birds of Paradise, there's a 17 there. That means it's a dungeon room. So that's not an actual entrance. I just wish that was a little bit more clear. The layout of the dungeon descriptions is very good. It uses bullet points. Generally speaking, as you go in a level or up a level, I suppose, with each of the bullet points, you get more detailed descriptions. So when you first walk into a room, you just have to look at the main bullet points. And then if they want more information, you can move inward, which is a great way to do it. A great use of uh, different colors to point out uh, different locations and uh, items are done in pink. So that's just really helpful because you can easily scan and see if there's any magic items in here that you should keep track of. As is traditional, the first level of a dungeon is really not too exciting. You're going to have pretty basic encounters there and it's not going to be too weird. But as you get deeper and deeper, things are going to start getting out of hand. We have a level here that is an enormous aviary full of birds. And as you can see from the profile view here, it's a bunch of nested cages, one inside the other. And you can find ways to move from one to the other as you explore. And there's also these little kind of sub levels that go out from a couple of the cages. And this is one of these examples of a location that seems cool in theory. And there's a lot of fun locations in it too, and just encounters, but it's one of those places that would be very difficult to describe to players exactly what they're looking at, unless you're willing to draw pictures. Whereas something like a normal dungeon level, you're really just describing one room at a time, right? You're either in a hallway or you're in a room and you know what to describe. When you can see through each of these cages into other areas, how much do you describe? How much do you tell them? Because they should be able to see pretty much everything in here, and it's gonna be a really big jumble of information. There are some really fun uh, weapons that you can find in the armory right here, like Sword Plague. Molten swords fall from the sky. All targets in a 60 foot diameter circle must save uh, versus magical device or take 66 damage and be pinned to the spot for one round. That's great stuff. There's some traps here, but they're very clearly um, foreshadowed so players can anticipate them or use them against enemies, like a series of portraits that have all been chopped through by some powerful force. And if you stand in front of the uh, portrait to examine it, then an ax swings at your head, right? Pretty clear what's gonna happen there if you're paying attention. I like traps like that. Another level is very space themed where there's a big orrery that you can activate. You can even meet an alien in the tomb of the visitor, and there's a way to actually access a fortress on the planet Mars. Besides that, you can investigate this area down here where that's all been flooded with water and there is a huge tentacly beast in here that can send its tentacles through these tunnels to try and grab you. So you'll have to probably deal with that to really get all the way over here to the rare book room. The secret passage to Mars takes you to this little castle right here where dwarves have set up a forge and there is inside the castle a small white dwarf star. 
that they are using to forge magic swords, which is a really cool idea. There's even little exits to places like Nilfheim, although it's not really described in a lot of detail, so you would have to kind of make up mostly what happens there. There's a number of points in this book that have, again, really great ideas, but don't flesh it out in a lot of detail, possibly to save space, and so that would leave the Game Master really with a lot of room and a lot of things to make up on their own. You could either make it up if you enjoy doing that, or you could simply cut that material and remove the door so you don't have to deal with it. If you make it all the way down to the rare book room, there's a lot of fun stuff down there. For example, you can get the Necronomicon itself, probably a bad idea to read that, Lesser Key of Solomon, or even the Yellow Book of Breckewald, which I assume is not this book exactly? If you gave them this book exactly, then they would simply be able to cheat their way through the rest of the game. So I assume that it's something very similar to this one. It says it's a book that records the history of the place and its inhabitants, although it's difficult to find information on anyone but yourself. And there's a little note from E here, who is probably the author of the book. And there's also notes from this guy throughout this book. So there's a kind of this weird recursive thing going on where the author of the book is talking to you as you read it. A level of antiquities and alchemy that's just packed with weird artifacts and a whole bunch of interesting puzzles right here where sections of the dungeon are exist in two different forms, one while you're waking, one while you're sleeping. So if you go to a particular bed and fall asleep, you can then interact with parts of the rooms that aren't there otherwise. And some of these puzzles need to be finished by doing one thing in the room in the sleep mode and one in wake mode. So I like that having different versions of each room. Like here, while you're awake, you can turn this dial to change the gravity of the room in the dream world. And then you can go back while dreaming and climb along the ceiling to get this key. There's a whole bunch of fairy tale artifacts you can pick up here, like Snow White's Bower Bed or Cinderella's Glass Slipper. You can get Mjolnir, although how you're going to pick it up is a bit of a question. Anansi's Web, Aladdin's Lamp. You decide if there's still a wish-granting genie inside. You can find a glob of Alkahest, which is the universal solvent that dissolves any material. It's just floating in the air, of course, because it, if it was any kind of container, it would melt through it. There is a homunculus that you could possibly uh, change to follow your commands instead of the commands of the alchemist who created it. It'd be great to have a little homunculus servant to follow you around. And a poison cabinet with things like exsanguinant. Blood flows continuously from orifices for D3 days. No other ill effects. Or perhaps bottled famine. Food no longer nourishes the drinker who starves to death. This area has an enormous hall of records. You can think of it like the parts in Harry Potter, like, a, what is it, like the Room of Requirement, where there's just giant stacks of junk, in this case, uh, cabinets full of files stretching up into the ceiling, going on for forever and ever. It's this giant maze that you can try and walk through. Um, there's areas like a diploma mill. <laughs> this one's really funny, where there's just a bunch of goblins that have snuck in from the forest, and they are creating a diploma mill and just selling diplomas for Breckewald to anyone who writes in. There's a Malkovichian door where you can walk through this door and into the mind of the headmaster of the school, just like in the movie Being John Malkovich. One of the fun things about this book is just the strange random tables and the stuff that you can discover if you want to dig around enough. Like if you go through the records room and start looking through dissertations, you might find things like the Smoking Mountain. It posits that the Smoking Mountain, which is a actual mountain nearby uh, Breckewald, you can get to it on the hex crawl is a den of the Red Dragon of Britain, who currently lies slumbering, coiled in protection around the throne of Arthur, arrested in the moment before death by Morgan Le Fay. That's actually true. You can actually find um, Arthur if you search the uh, mountain. So there's real concrete information right here. This book is not very coy about, you know, not giving you the information you need yet, or only giving you parts of it. It's pretty explicit. When you find information, it's good information, and it's going to lead to more adventure, which is, I think is the, the correct way to do things. There's a dwarf fortress area that you can explore. There is a binary gate where you need to understand um, binary language, just, you know, ones and zeros, how to, how to write uh, our number system using ones and zeros. And if you unlock that, then you enter into a, another little pocket dimension or a portal to another part of the universe where there is an elven flying ship that is plying the space between the stars, hunting these star whales. And is this a whole nother adventure or a whole nother campaign? Yeah, probably. It just has it in a couple of pages, though, so you can explore the ship if you want. If you really want to take off in that ship, well, I guess you're on your own. You'll have to make up a whole bunch of stuff. Once we get deep into the castle, things start getting really strange. A huge petrified forest down here and a bunch of very strange locations and rooms. In order to get into this room, you have to pass through the mirror gate, where you open up this, these swinging doors and behind it is just a mirror. And of course, your mirror image steps forward and fights you. The only way to get past this is to allow your mirror image to slay you. 
And then there is this weird change of perspective as you suddenly find yourself standing with you dead at your feet and on the other side of the mirror. Magic items start getting more and more mythological, like you can find the mourning veil, which is the veil that Eve wore after she was separated from her secret child, who is born at dawn, the mother of all elves. You can find the Black Cauldron, like from the Black Cauldron series of books, where you can put living creatures into it and get zombie versions of them that obey you. You can even find a portal into hell if you really want to go there, though I wouldn't really recommend it. I like how this area is just called hell. Doesn't really describe it because again, that would probably be an entire different campaign. At the very bottom, you actually find the Crystal Cave, the place where Merlin is currently frozen in time inside the uh, a crashed asteroid that's a geode inside, guarded by, of course, Nimue and this giant frog who can breathe acid at you. Actually reaching Merlin, who is, of course, aging backwards, just like in The Once and Future King, requires you going through a number of memory shards, working through his memory and bits of his history until you reach him and you can finally wake him. Here's a little hex crawl that you can go through. Each of these has its own particular locations and encounters there. I like how it's this kind of isometric, almost 3D look where you can see each hex is a little bit taller or shorter. It works in most cases. There's a couple places around here, especially, where it's a little bit hard to tell exactly what height the hexes are supposed to be. Um, I guess you can kind of, you know, fudge it as you go if you really need to. I, I think I wish that would be a little bit more clear, um, but I like the look of it in general. You can find the Tower of Morgaz herself. There is a Maiden, Mother, and Crone coven around here, and you can find each of those members if you explore enough. I like how actually trying to go up her tower takes you through a bunch of strange, almost like parable-like encounters, where on the ground story, um, it reveals yawning blackness inside rain pours and thunder crashes. Characters find themselves shrunk down in a nest protected by an eagle. A blood-colored viper coils around the nest, striking and killing the eagle before coming for the characters in three chicks, an eaglet. Once slain, the viper becomes stairs leading up. And each level is its own little kind of mini story that you have to work through. You can find old King Lloyd, who's basically King Lear from Shakespeare. There's a couple of mini dungeons or mini locations that you can explore, like the waterfall mine right here, where you can find the crone, the abbey of Our Lady of Perpetual Obstinance. There's a lot of fun little shrines to made up saints scattered around, like St. Pancras the Lesser. Um, he's the patron saint of inferiority complexes and the past over. That's really great. They all have fun little blessings like uh, for the offering of the blood of a middle child or written proof of disappointment from a parent or employer, the saint will ensure you receive due credit for your thankless toil. You can meet a hedge wizard. You can meet the merry band of outlaws. You can visit St. Codwalder, who did not die very easily. He has the record for the most martyrdoms, you see. And you can get to the Smoking Mountain itself where you see the Red Dragon of England coiled around the throne of Arthur. Uh, to wake him up is going to be pretty tricky. You're probably going to have to find Excalibur or an Excalibur substitute if you really want to bring him back from the dead. There is a bridge over a river guarded, of course, by a Black Knight, because this would not be a King Arthur story without Monty Python references. And there is a whole bunch of random tables at the back with all sorts of things that you can use to flesh out uh, your campaign, like treasures. This is a list of the, all the actual treasures in the book and where they are and what their value is. Very useful to have. And it's broken down by location. So if you're in the orrery, what are all the magical stuff there that you could find? It's all right here. This is also broken down by forest locations and different stuff that the faculty has. And you got random tables for what type of food there is at different parts of the year. Because the actual season matters because you have this term system where it depends on which term you're in uh, throughout the course of the year. And you have, you know, four years to get through your time at Breckewald. So when your time runs out, I guess you graduate. Maybe you can keep playing, but I like the idea of a constrained amount of time where each term you have like a little mini campaign delving down into the dungeon or out into the hex crawl. And then after enough terms have gone by, I guess eight of them. So, you know, two for each of the years, then the campaign just wraps up. So you have a you know limited amount of time to do stuff and you have to plan your time accordingly. This is really fun. There's a recipe for suckling vol pie, which is something that comes up a bunch during the adventure. You keep hearing about this pie. And if you find all of the different ingredients, which are found in different parts of the dungeon or in the hex crawl, then you can finally bake it yourself. And upon consumption, each bout of vomiting, 2d4 times, redeemed when the player chooses, shall bring forth a miracle in the form of a crucial object at the critical time. It might even give you a small beast amenable to instructions. There's a knight errant generator where you can generate their heraldry and their characteristics and their quest, things like that, along with fairy knight generators because those are things that you can find. 
students and other NPCs. So if you just want to spend some time talking to people in the castle, the Game Master could roll up a couple of these people. For example, you have Thunderheads of an Eve. It's an elf. Personality is calculating. Their motivation is nationalism. Uh, possession is a bell, and they have one signature spell. Maybe you can recruit them to come on a expedition with you if you need hirelings of a sort. The random encounter tables for the wilderness are broken down by season, and each one is a D100 table. So you have lots of different things that you can run into. You roll a D20 while you're on a road and a D100 when you go off the road. So things get a lot more strange as you go deeper into the wilderness. One for autumn and you have one for winter. And then at the very back, we also are gonna have one for the dungeon encounters. So for this, you roll a D100 every two turns, but on the first level, you treat results over 30 as no encounter. Second level, do the same up to 40 and et cetera, et cetera. So as you go deeper in, you're gonna have access to much of the higher level or weirder encounters, which might be stuff like Ha Nargal, a slug-like demon worshiped as a god of death in ancient Central Asia, or maybe a carnivorous book that can disguise itself as any book and eats the thoughts of its reader. So that is the Yellow Book of Brekkewold. As usual, I have put links in the description below where you can pick this up for yourself if you are so inclined. And remember that uh, Knave Second Edition is available for pre-order over on Backerkit. I will put a link to that as well. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.